did we do yesterday? What was yesterday <laughs> focused upon? The parametric. We were developing those parametric equations for the different conic sections. Okay. Now today we're going to come back and focus in on the ellipse, right? And the parametric equation for the ellipse, x equals y equals r, well you remember, they're so much like the circle, right? They're so much like the circle, the only difference is that there's different proportions horizontally uh, and vertically, right? So what were our parametric equations? Do you remember? A cos theta. A cos theta. Yeah. And B sine theta. Excellent. Okay. Now, what is the point of introducing a parameter? Uh, as we met in um, the parametrics of a parabola, right? Number one, you get this nice way of saying I can define any point on my locus just with a single number rather than with two numbers. Okay. Uh, and secondly, it makes particular kinds of questions, <coughs> particular kinds of geometry easier to deal with. Okay. Uh, easier to deal with, easier to express, easier to articulate. Okay. Uh, and I sort of teased some of that before. Tangents, normals, and chords are going to be the main, the primary example of things that this unlocks in a bit of an easier way. Okay, um, we're not going to do chords today, probably. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Depends how much um, time we get on the exercise. But what I'm going to show you is how to develop the equation for the tangent and then the normal to the ellipse. We're going to do it both ways. We're going to do it parametrically using this as our basis. Okay, and then we're also going to develop it in Cartesian equations, just so you can understand. You do actually need to have both things <coughs> there, but you will see quite rapidly how, how far superior this is in most cases. Okay. Alright, so just really quickly for me, um, for the sake of illustration, draw an ellipse. Let's get the picture in our heads. Here's the scenario we're talking about. We have a nice, very, very standard ellipse. And based on some angle measured from the positive x-axis up to, like using that, uh, that, it's not a radius, using that interval that goes up to the point on the locus that we're at, so I'll call it that P, right? We have these parametric equations which, which give us a way to express the coordinates of this point, right? A cos theta B sine theta. Okay. So onto here, now we can draw, like what are we trying to find? We're trying to find a general expression for what's the equation of the tangent adjustments that you get the idea. To the tangent at that point, at any point P for any value theta. Okay. Now let's just think about this. If I know where the point is, what other piece of information, I only need one, will give me the equation of the tangent. I just need the gradient, and then I'll pop it into point gradient form. Y minus y1 equals m outside of x1, <coughs> plus x1 and then out will cut right away, equation. Okay? So let's go ahead and let's do that. Now, pause for a second. Don't write this next part down. This is one of the reasons why the parametric equations are more powerful, okay? Or they're a little more elegant in this way. What is the equation of this um, ellipse at the moment? What's the equation? Yep, x squared on a squared. Yep, x squared on a squared. Plus y squared on b squared equals 1. Okay? Now, in order to get this piece of information you just asked me for, the gradient, right, I clearly am going to need to differentiate this guy in some way. Okay? And by the way, we will. But look, it's a royal mess. Like, for starters, it's not a function, it's a relation. So you've got to get two derivatives, or two values for the derivative of every point where the ellipse exists. That's kind of a bit of a pain. Not to mention the fact that. It just all tangled up. Like the, the form that we've chosen that makes the geometry of the ellipse easiest to work with, like where's the major axis, where's the minor axis. This is a nice form to understand where all of those things are, like this. This form of the equation of the ellipse is really nice for that and really sucky for calculus. Okay? So therefore, like using the Cartesian equations, that's not where I'm going to go first. Okay? Now therefore I'm going to go. So these guys, okay? Now, this causes a minor problem for us because those are, um, those are trig functions, right? And we have not dealt with the calculus of the trig functions yet. We will deal with them at, well, end of this term, beginning of next term. 
But I'm just going to show you the results for them. I will give you a quick visual intuition to validate the results. And then we're going to use them in a similar way to how, you know, um, I talked about something like this. This result, you learn it in year seven, right? The actual math to prove that this is the case, like the, the rigorous math, you only learnt last year, after four whole years. Now you will not have to wait this long to get the formal rigorous proofs for the derivatives of these functions, okay? But you will have to wait a little bit, all right? So, on the side here, uh, and maybe in a separate color, what I'd like you to write for me is, the derivatives of the two basic tree functions. Now, we'll get these results, I'm going to draw, and you're going to draw some very, very quick basic pictures, which are not a proof at all, but just kind of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Right. So, a picture of sine. What does a picture of sine look like? Um, I'm not going to have much space there. If you draw a very little sketch of sine x, just from 0 to 2 pi, like so. What conclusions can you draw about the gradient function of this graph, right? just by looking at them, just by doing a, a sort of basic idea. One of the quickest things you can see, just from like when we did this, and we said, here's a graph, do the first derivative, do the second derivative, we've done this visually before. There are two stationary points. So that tells you the derivative at two different points. What are those values, by the way? Radians? Radians? Where are they? At pi on two, there is a stationary point, and at three pi on two, there's just another stationary point, right? So that's good. I've got two points that I know the gradient must pass through. At the same time, I look before this stationary point and I say, oh look, this gradient is positive and decreasing. Right? It's positive and kind of decreasing, down like that. Like it has to come down to zero at x equals minus two. Then over here, what's going on? How do you describe what's happening in, in between the two stationary points? What is the sign of the derivative? It's negative, right? It's negative. It is a little bit negative here, and it gets more and more negative until this point here, and then it sort of gets less negative, and it gets shallow again until you hit zero, which is the next stationary point. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. The derivative, it gets negative, and it gets increasingly negative until it has to come back up, because it slows down and it gets to another stationary point. And then to finish it off, what's happening over here is kind of a reverse image of what's happening over here. I have a positive gradient, so therefore the derivative has to have a positive sign. Okay. Now just on this quick visual, what does that gradient function look like to you? Cos. That looks a heck of a lot like cosine to me. Okay. <coughs> so therefore, we're actually going to say just on our intuition, right, that the derivative of sine is cos. It is exactly cos. And the, um, the formal proof for this is quite... It's quite Beautiful, but it's long, so we're not going to address it today. Okay. Now, lastly, again, and we'll do this one a bit quicker. Draw me a little version of cosine. <clears throat> there are stationary points on cosine, right? We've just drawn it from 0 to 2 pi. How many stationary points do you count? I count, I count one, two, three stationary points. Do you agree? Points at which I could draw a horizontal tangent. Okay. So therefore, the gradient function at naught and and pi and two pi, the gradient should be zero at all those points. So here, here, and here. Yep. <coughs> okay. Now let's have a look between the first two stationary points. What's the sign of the derivative here? It's negative. Look, the whole thing is decreasing in this domain, right? It's um, doing the same thing it did up here, right? It's like really, really, really decreasing at that point, but then it's got to kind of slow back down even though it's still decreasing. It's got to get to a stationary point. And then over here, it is the exact same thing but backwards. You've got an increasing function from pi to 2 pi. The steepest point is here. That's when it's moving the fastest. It's steepest, right? And then you've got to get back to the stationary point. So you sort of calm down like that. What does that graph look like? Maybe. Yeah, it's sine x but upside down. Okay, so let's jot that down. Again, this is not a proof, but it's intuitive enough that you can see, yeah, okay, that makes sense. 